Welcome to the Journal Editorial Report. I'm Paul Gigo. A big step forward this week in the Republican tax reform effort as the Senate passed a budget blueprint Thursday night that paves the way for $1.5 trillion in tax cuts and blocks Democrats from filibustering a final deal. So can the GOP deliver on that deal before year's end? Let's ask Wall Street Journal Deputy Editor Dan Henninger, columnist Kim Strassel, editorial page writer Kate Batchelder odell and columnist Bill McGurn. So, uh, Dan, let's uh, start here. Are the Republicans getting their act together on taxes uh, after the health care fiasco? I guess the short answer would be yes, Paul. They actually got 51 votes to pass a budget rather than 48 or 49 and failed everybody to pass a but, piece of legislation. Everybody but Rand Paul. Everybody but Rand Paul. And uh, it's too bad, I think, that Senator Thad Cochran had to be wheeled all the way from Mississippi on his sickbed. You'd think his other fellow senators like Collins, Murkowski, and McCain could have committed themselves to voting for this and not make him come. But that's the way the Senate Republicans work now. The budget was basically a conceit at this point, a stepping stone to get towards tax reform. And I do feel as though these Republicans now have the sense that they are embarked on something very serious, have a little bit of wind at their back, and now we're gonna go forward to the tax reform and do something that the president and every member of the party, with perhaps the exception of Rand Paul, really wants to do. And Kate, the key here is the $1.5 trillion uh, uh, bogey here, which lets them cut taxes by that net amount. Uh, so they're not hostage to the scoring from the Congressional Budget Office entirely. They're not hostage to the Joint Tax Committee. These institutions created by Democrats years ago that tend to be a, to make it harder to reform taxes. That's right, yes. I mean, basically, that's a conservative number on how much revenue we could expect to flow to the Treasury for growth. Why? Why? Why CBO that? says that for every 0.1% you add to GDP, you get about $270 billion in revenue. CBO is not a, a pro-growth institution, so those are conservative estimates. And CBO also assumes that the economy grows at 1.9% over the next 10, ten that's, years. That's their estimate. Which is very weak. So a return to 3% growth, the historical norm, would produce more than 2.7% trillion under CBO's rough calculation. So 1.5 trillion, which is what the Senate is considering, is, is relatively conservative. But there's no guarantee that the House Budget Committee, the House Budget passed its own reform and they had deficit neutral. There's no guarantee right now that the House will accept the Senate. That's right, but the, they really need to stick to this 1.5 trillion because it's the only way to finance lower rates and they have to pay for those rates. So the House now can either uh, pick up the Senate's version or go to conference and my view is they should just pick it up and pass it and we can be done with this. Bill, uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Senate version is the best vehicle for getting what to where they want to be on tax reform. Look, the uh, the passing of the budget is mostly symbolic, right? It, it's not so much a big victory as its defeat would have killed tax reform. That's the real importance. Well, and you have to have it to get the 51 vote threshold. Right. And I think I, I'm optimistic because, look, you never know what John McCain's going to do. He voted against the Bush tax cuts when he was senator, then ran on tax cuts when he was running for president. But I think Republicans are much more, there are two things, they're more comfortable making this argument about growth and incentives and taxes than they were about Obamacare, which was cast, Obamacare repeal, which was cast as taking insurance away from people. I think they're more comfortable on this, and I think they understand the downside of first the humiliation on Obamacare repeal and then on tax reform would would personally come back to haunt a lot of them in 2018. Uh, Kim, uh, do you give much credit here to the much maligned majority leader, Mitch McConnell, who behind the scenes was working with Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania and uh, Bob Corker of Tennessee on the Budget Committee to try to get together a budget hawk like Corker and a tax cutter like to me to be able to put together this deal. Does, does McConnell get credit for that? He gets immense credit. People like to talk about the Senate as the graveyard uh, where all good legislation goes to die. But in this case, it was a House that could not get its act together, in part because of what Dan said. There was this conceit that the budget really matters in terms of the deficit or spending. Of course, what we all know is that it bears no relation in the end to actual spending. This was solely a vehicle for tax reform. So McConnell went, uh, and not only did he get Corker and Toomey and set the blueprint for this, which I do 
do think the House is going to take. But he also got a lot of senators this last week to start talking about the fact that this is only a vehicle for tax reform, uh, to, to drop the illusion that the budget part of it matters. And that should pressure House Republicans to go along. All right. Uh, peer inside, if you can, Dan. The mind of Rand Paul, <laughs> who is a libertarian, it claims to be, be for small government, like tax cuts. Why would he vote against something that would have what makes tax reform possible? You know, you had me thinking there of Johnny Carson for a moment, <laughs> the great Karnak, what's in my head. And yeah. Rand Paul, it's difficult to know, other than it seems to be about Rand Paul. And on either health care or taxes, there is a sense in which you are doing this for the good of the country. Well, right? one hopes. One would hope. So Rand Paul, by definition, seems to be doing it for the good of Rand Paul. And there's been, he's become the biggest outlier in the Republican Party and the Senate that we have seen in a very long time. All right. Thank you all. When we come back, a final push by U.S.-backed forces in Raqqa ousts the Islamic State from its self-declared capital. So does the U.S. have a post-ISIS strategy for the Middle East? We'll ask General Jack Keane next. American-backed forces in Syria declared victory this week in the northern city of Raqqa, dealing a major blow to ISIS in its de facto capital. Raqqa's liberation by the Syrian Democratic Forces, a coalition of Kurdish and Arab militias, may mark the end of Islamic State self-declared caliphate in Iraq and Syria. But does the U.S. have a strategy for a post ISIS Middle East. Let's ask retired four-star general Jack Keane. He's a Fox News military analyst. So, General, welcome. Good to have you back. Let me ask you first, before we get to Raqqa, about General John Kelly's uh, 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 statement at the White House on Thursday. What did you make of that uh, uh, statement? Well, I, I've never seen anything quite like that 17-minute message that he delivered to the American people. The, the eloquence of his conviction, sincerity, and his emotion uh, was a just a powerful civic lesson to the American people, letting them understand the most sacred process we have in this country dealing with our fallen. And I, I, I absolutely agree with his rather crushing rebuke of Congresswoman Wilson in, in, in entering into that process and, and discrediting the soldier and his family as a result of exposing it to a public discussion and debate. All right, thank you. Uh, now, on Raqqa, how big a defeat is this losing that territory, that second capital, after they've lost Mosul and Iraq? How big a defeat for ISIS? Yeah, it is. I mean, they're the first terrorist organization in some time that took a safe haven right in the middle of a very active country like that. And this is a very resilient organization. Several hundred fighters moved into Syria because of the stalemated civil war. They were all right. Iraqi fighters in 2012. A year and a half later, under al-Baghdadi's leadership and his other leaders, they grew to 30,000 when they invaded Iraq in 2014. This organization is not going away way that the caliphate certainly is they will still be a challenge for us in the middle east they've expanded into 30 other countries right they they've attacked nato either inspired or directed 39 times in the last two and a half years nonetheless this is a major accomplishment for the United States. We should feel good about it. We should feel good about the coalition that did this. But we've got to take their finances away. We've got to take their virtual caliphate away and stay on top of them. Okay, now how much credit here do you think the Trump administration gets for this uh, uh, victory as opposed to the Obama administration? Uh, because the Obama administration folks say, look, all, that, all the Trump folks are doing is basically following through on our strategy. Yes or well, no? The, the Obama administration made a strategic error. The main effort should always have been the caliphate in Syria because that was their headquarters. We made the main effort Iraq, and yet we had to wait for a year and a half to get the the troops retrained to be able to, to do it. During that entire time, we should have taken this caliphate away. And in my judgment, ISIS would not have become this significant, iconic force it became and be able to direct its activities worldwide. Five years in that caliphate was much too long. All that said, the facts are that the Trump administration came in, took the Obama plan, but made it more effective. Really, 
easing up on the rules of engagement, putting artillery in there, Apache helicopters, giving the, the commanders on the ground full authority to conduct a war, no micromanaging out of the White House. So they deserve credit for changing how we operate and making those operations more effective. Okay, now let's move on from here. What now? Because I don't uh, detect, frankly, any U.S. clear U.S. strategy of what happens next, what we want to do next in Syria or Iraq. Can you, can you decipher one? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we have to clear out the rest of the Euphrates River Valley southeast of Raqqa, where the leaders of Raqqa are still. They, okay. They've been out of Raqqa for some time. Secondly, I agree with what you just said. I don't see a strategy to deal with Syria writ large. In other words, the western part of Syria, Iran, Russia, and Assad, they are in total control, and there's no taking that away from them without conducting a major military operation where there's no political will for that. But the eastern part of Syria, we should be containing Iran's ambitions to take full control of Syria by taking the east. And I don't see any strategy to stop that, Paul. And I think that's a strategic mistake on the part of the administration. That's right. Okay, so I, I agree with you on that. Now, the Kurds are saying, the Kurds who are our, they were our fighters on the ground in clearing out uh, ISIS out of Iraq. And they're saying, hey, you know, we'd like to keep this territory. We have a right to uh, at least some autonomy here. Can the U.S., uh, uh, how should we treat the Kurds in, uh, in their ambitions going forward? In, in Iraq, the, the issue has always been the political end state. Can the Iraqis keep a country together with the Sunnis and the Shias and the Kurds operating, at, at least coexisting together? And we knew that the challenges would be there after ISIS, and here they are right in front of us. I think the United States has got to get involved in this. The Iranians are in full back in the, the government of Iraq stomping all over the Kurds. We've got to stop that from happening. I think, yes, the Kurds should have more autonomy than they currently have is something we should negotiate. I'm not talking about complete independence. Right. I, I think the fact that they were the fighters on the ground for 18 months while the Iraqi army was trying to get its act together, there should be major concessions to them. I think maybe a higher percentage of oil that they, they should receive as a result of that. They, the government of Iraq has to make some concessions to the Kurds or else we're going to find ourselves likely in some kind of civil war here. The Iranians could care less about the Kurds and they have considerably more political influence over the government of Iraq than the United States have. And that is a, a strategic mistake the Obama administration has. And I'm hoping the Trump team steps up here and realizes how important U.S. political influence on the government of Iraq is to the future stability of that country. All right. Thank you, General Keene. Appreciate it. Yeah, good talking to you. When we come back, our panel weighs in on America's post-ISIS strategy in the Middle East, as well as John Kelly's powerful defense of President Trump's condolence call to a gold star widow. I said to him, sir, there's nothing you can do to lighten the burden on these families. But let me tell you what I tell them. And what, let me tell you what my best friend Joe Dunford told me, because he was my casualty officer. He said, Kel, um, he was doing exactly what he wanted to do when he was killed. That was White House Chief of Staff John Kelly in an emotional and very personal defense of President Trump's phone call this week to the widow of a slain Army soldier. Mr. Kelly describing on Thursday what it was like to learn about his own son's death in Afghanistan and calling criticism of the president unfair. We're back with Dan Henniger, Bill McGurn, and Wall Street Journal editorial board member Mary Kissel. So, uh, Bill, uh, you've been in the White House. Uh, you know uh, presidents have to make uh, calls like that. What did you make of the general? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I was in the White House, uh, I saw President Bush do this quite often, to meet with the families. And in fact, I brought in two different moms of Marines that had been killed, one Jewish mom from Vermont and one uh, Catholic mom from uh, Massachusetts. It's, it's, it's an incredible thing to watch uh, people deal with the commander in chief on whose orders um, your son, husband, brother probably died. Uh, John Kelly brought two terrible um, 
attributions into that. One, he's the father of a Marine, so he's gone through it that way. Also, he was a Marine commander who gave orders knowing that it would result in the death of very good Marines. So he that, speaks with an awesome. He speaks with tremendous moral He, he does, and I, I urge people to Google it, to read the transcript, and go back and read another speech that John Kelly gave the day after his son uh, was killed, about two Marines who stood their ground against a truck bomb. It's just an incredible uh, kind of thing. Dan, do you think there's going to be any fallout from this in this in the, in a good sense in that you know we really kind of reached a low here when we are politicizing grief and sacrifice of soldiers which is what's happened uh, and uh, and politicizing a phone call from Trump is uh, will we all kind of step back and give a pause here or are we just going to keep going down I think most of us are going to step back, Paul, but the question is, are the two uh, main parties to this uh, fiasco going to step back? And that would be the White House press corps and the President of the United States. All right? Look, what John Kelly was trying to say here is that he could not believe we would reach the point where the press was playing gotcha, as they do every day of the week, and then the president was cracking back with tweets against this Democratic Congresswoman. Where is the level of seriousness about the nation's business? And I think John Kelly felt he had an obligation to come forward and say, this has got to stop. If you cannot even be serious over the death of a fallen soldier, how can you be serious about the rest of the nation's business? All right, Mary, let's move on to ISIS and Syria. Uh, and uh, I, I want to pick up where General Keene left off. What do you think about the strategy here? Do you detect one on the part of the Trump administration of what we do now that the caliphate is gone? Yeah, I think I'm with you and General Keene here, Paul. I don't think that there is a strategy for Syria. Syria or for Iraq and it actually in some respects the president's strategy in the Middle East is a little bit schizophrenic because on the one hand he did a deal with Russia in Syria which also gave shelter to Iran and jihadis in Syria. This is for the ceasefire in southern Syria near uh, near uh, Israel. That's right and then on the other hand he came out with a big speech in these last days saying you know what we're going to contain Iran's ambitions in the Middle East so there isn't a strategy the war on Islamic State has not been won. We still have thousands of fighters uh, straddling Dispersed the border now. between Syria, Iraq, and as General Keene said, uh, in many, many countries around the world. And look, I just don't think you can get rid of the ISIS threat in Syria without getting rid of Assad. And it's a truth that this administration doesn't want to talk about, but I, I'm afraid to say, Paul, that I, I think that's, I think that's well, how you know, it is. Well, you know, another potential casualty of this is that both Secretary of Defense Mattis and uh, NSC Director uh, General McMaster have made a point about the United States reconstituting their association with our allies, whether in Asia or in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia. But if the administration, the president, has a kind of half-in, half-out attitude towards something that Mary just described, our allies in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, the Kurds, who we just have more or less abandoned to the Iraqis and the Iranians, are going to stand back and say, I don't know if we can get in this fight that you're going to try to take to the Iranians. But Mary, the president just uh, in the campaign, basically his, his, what he said about the Middle East is, I'm going to defeat ISIS, I'm going to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. He didn't say anything else <laughs> about what to do in Syria. He had no strategy, no plan. And I don't see any, any real willingness to deploy any American troops back there. Well, the president also said he was going to get out of Afghanistan. Remember that? And then he spent six months studying the issue, and he went on national television and said, you know what? I made a mistake during the campaign. I was wrong. Here's my comprehensive strategy. We are changing tack here in the White House. And hopefully he will do the same thing when it comes to policy yeah. in the yeah, Middle East. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think we might never get a coherent Trump doctrine. I think that what we're likely to get is some of what we have now where the parts are better than the whole. And I will say this victory in Iraq, in Raqqa, one of the things that it does is it exposes a complete falsehood that our choice, as Obama used to say all the time, was between a full-scaled invasion or doing nothing. Um, it should give us hope that if, if you can support local forces with some troops and some air support and some, some operations capacity, you can accomplish a lot. So I think we have to hope for Donald Trump. I don't think he's going to give us the kind of Reagan doctrine or Bush doctrine that we got before. Uh, I think that's a fair bet. Uh, still ahead, two officials behind the so-called Trump dossier take the fifth. 
before the House Intelligence Committee as the wide-ranging probe into Russia's influence in the 2016 campaign continues. We'll have the latest next. First it was, I did not have communications with Russians, which was not true. Then it was, I never met with any Russians to discuss any political campaign, which may or may not be true. Now it's, I did not discuss interference in the campaign. Let me just say this without hesitation, that I conducted no improper cam uh, discussions with Russians at any time regarding a campaign or any other uh, item facing this country. A heated exchange this week between Democratic Senator Al Franken and Attorney General Jeff Sessions over then Senator Sessions' communications with the Russians during the 2016 presidential election. That exchange at Senate at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing Wednesday came the same day as two top officials at Fusion GPS, the opposition research firm behind the unverified dossier alleging Russian ties to the Trump campaign, invoked their Fifth Amendment rights before the House Intelligence Committee. The FBI this week also posted a document suggesting that former Director James Comey began drafting his statement exonerating Hillary Clinton in the email probe months before his July 2016 announcement. We're back with Dan Henniger, Kim Strassel, and Bill McGurn. So, Kim, let's start off with uh, Fusion GPS. Why should we care about this company? Well, look, Paul, we have House investigators and uh, special counsel Robert Mueller looking into allegations that the Trump campaign colluded with Russians. And we need the answers to that question. But it's also reasonable to want to know where some of those allegations came from. And a lot came from this dossier that Fusion GPS commissioned with the help of a former British spook, who we now know was working with some Russians. We need to understand the extent to which Russia influenced that dossier if at all, and whether or not our law enforcement then relied on a piece of disinformation to conduct its probe into Trump. So it could be, Kim, and what we're trying to find out is, did uh, uh, this American company commission this document for, and, and therefore promote r that included a lot of Russian disinformation, and then that could have actually started the FBI investigation uh, back in 2016 into the Trump campaign? Could that have been the, the start of it all? Well, it's, it's unlikely that it started it, but it seems very clear that the FBI in some form or fashion may have relied on this document to ramp up its investigation, potentially even to get some of the warrants that it used. And the House Intelligence Committee is struggling not just to get Fusion to give it information about the origin of this document and what went into it, but struggling to get the FBI to hand over information about how it ended up using the document. All right, Bill. And it this this Steele dossier, Christopher right. Steele is the, the former spy that uh, Kim talked about. Is Has this been corroborated or is, is it largely discredited? You no, know, a lot of us call it discredited because there have been individual aspects such as Trump's lawyer meeting in Prague and he's never been to Prague and so forth. So but a lot of it is false. I think Fusion says that they stand by it. Um, and again, if we're really going to understand Russia's role, uh, we'd like to know who paid for this. It looks like at one point that Christopher Steele had a relationship with the FBI uh, to pay for some things, then they didn't pay. But uh, we need to know that. The FBI is being very uncooperative. And, of course, Senator Al Franken would like to keep us stuck back in November 2016 and focusing on Jeff Sessions. There's been no other information showing Jeff Sessions did anything on improper and he recused himself. We need a lot of answers on, on the other side. And what's mystifying uh, for Jeff Sessions is that the Donald Trump Department of Justice is stonewalling congressional efforts to find out about this damaging dossier on Donald Trump. Well, but Sessions has recused himself from yes. that, so that responsibility would fall to Rod Rosenstein, right. the deputy AG. Why don't they turn it over, uh, Dan? I don't understand. Uh, I don't either, except that, um, you know, these are the security and intelligence services, the FBI, and usually the wagons get circled under circumstances like this. But this is one instance in which maybe that circle should be broken, because I think 
I think one of the, the Democrats here do protest too much. The reason they are cranking it up to this level is because I think, A, we need to know where this dossier came from, and B, I think there is a big question of whether the Obama administration, if I may put it this way, was colluding with the security and intelligence services. I mean, they're the ones who distributed some of this information about the possibility of Trump having involvement with the Russians. That got leaked into the press. That's how all of this started. Well, the so, intelligence services and the FBI, they worked for the Obama administration. <laughs> well, I mean, this is supposed to be basically independent operations that make judgments on their own. They aren't a tool of political tool of a presidential administration well, like that. Dan's point, we also have at the same time this parallel scandal about unmasking. And Samantha Power, we know, asked for hundreds of Former names. Former U.S. US Former, ambassador to the U.S. Now she's saying she didn't quite ask for them. I, I mean, it's unclear whether she asked on behalf of other people or other people used her name. I mean, all this is, is coming together. Look, the president tweeted out something, again, to Dan's point, that's just outraging the Democrats, saying, who paid for this fusion dossier. Was it the Democrats, the Kremlin, uh, or the FBI? And it's reasonable questions given what what we know. Why do we want to know this, uh, Kim? And do we really, I mean, uh, and, and are we going to get, I guess, let me put it this way. Are we going to get to the bottom of this? Are these people going to be able to get away with not testifying and not cooperating? Well, look, let's just back up for a second. Uh, the question that we're trying to answer is how did Russia and, and or did Russia influence or interfere in our election? And if it turns out that there was a document that Democrats paid for or commissioned that Russians ended up influencing to plant disinformation about a presidential candidate and inspire law enforcement to take action, that would definitely be interfering in our election process. So we need to know. Now, the House has sent out subpoenas. Uh, Fusion has refused to testify. But there are other ways that uh, the House can try to get some of the information that, that might explain who paid for everything and and we'll see that they could be held in contempt um, we still got a long way to go on this all right thank you very much Kim still ahead Facebook is under fire amid the growing furor over Russia's use of social media to influence the 2016 presidential race but could a hundred thousand dollars in ads really swing an election we'll ask a former Clinton advisor next some of the Facebook ads specifically targeted Michigan and Wisconsin, two of the states that decided the election by razor-thin margins, which suggests that the Russian strategy was even more sophisticated than we knew. Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg made the rounds on Capitol Hill last week amid the growing furor over Moscow's use of social media to influence the 2016 presidential election. The company revealed last month that a Russian firm with links to the Kremlin bought more than $100,000 worth of ads on Facebook between June 2015 and May 2017. But would that be enough to influence the outcome of a presidential race? Mark Penn is Managing Director of the Stagwell Group. He was chief strategist on Bill Clinton's 1996 presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton's 2000 Senate campaign, and Mrs. Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. So, uh, Mark, welcome. Good to see you. The, uh, Thank you. Uh, the, uh, you wrote an intriguing piece for us this week suggesting that $100,000 can't buy an election. Why don't you explain that? Well, look, the premise of the piece is enough fake news about fake news that if you just took a little simple math, Facebook told us that 56% was spent after the election. So only $44,000 could even have been in the election period. That most of it didn't refer to a candidate, that most of it was not in swing states. By the time you do the simple math, you get down to about $6,500, may have been in swing states during the year of the election. It's incredible that we're spending all this time talking about something like that, that, that just a little math explodes. All right, but there's a sort of a, a sense that I get talking to Democrats that says, you know, this election was so close in those key Midwestern states, so close in Wisconsin, that if foreign agents, foreign sources just poured a little money into those districts with a message that looked to be anti-Clinton or anti-Obama, uh, then you could actually influence the, the election in those states and turn the Electoral College. Uh, I, I wish that it was so easy. <laughs> 
Uh, I, I mean, $2.4 billion were spent on this presidential election. Hillary Clinton had a $400 million advantage over Donald Trump. And, and just in the last week, her super PAC put $6 million into Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Florida to suggest that a few thousand dollars of these incredibly targeted ads, which they weren't, they, they didn't even know when the election day was, is, is ludicrous. And we have to be honest with ourselves. Whether this argument hurts or helps Democrats, we have to have some honest, fact-based discussions in this country. All right. You compared uh, this in your piece to the, what the Chinese tried to do in 1996. And we know there were, you know, there's an attempt by foreign people, foreign uh, agents there to influence the campaign on behalf of Bill Clinton. But you say, you know, that that wasn't decisive either. Well, it, it wasn't decisive. Uh, it, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was probably bigger. And, and of course, money meant a little bit more uh, uh, in 1996. It was probably bigger, but we kept it in proportion. Uh, we did investigate it. There were some fundraisers who, who were prosecuted. It was clear the Chinese government had a, quote, China plan. Mm -hmm. No, uh, it, it wasn't decisive. But, but we didn't make it a national fixation. We, we tightened up validation procedures about foreign contributions and we should tighten up fake accounts and you know clearing ads and things like that we should we should clear that up we should take this as a warning that this wasn't something that really made a difference but somebody could in the future all right so your advice to Facebook Twitter and social media sites would be basically you're gonna have to dig into who the sources of these things are these ads are in the next election and make sure you screen out these foreign sourced ads because obviously if if we knew that a Russian ad was buying a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal, for example, attacking a candidate, we wouldn't take the money. Well, technically, the Supreme Court has protected non-candidate issue communications. So Facebook has a lot of issues to consider. I guess the point is, look, in good faith, you should have the basic procedures that a lot of TV stations have for ads that you run through political ads. You should really do your best on fake on, on fake accounts and make sure this doesn't become a, a real problem because uh, you know because we we got so overheated here uh, in doing this. It could become a real problem, but it wasn't. Okay. Now, uh, your party, the Democratic Party, are, are they paying too much attention here, in your view? to Russia's role in the election and saying, look, with the idea that that made this Trump's victory illegitimate, uh, is that are they just focusing too much on that, the last election, and not enough on the next one? Yeah, look, I think where the Democrats have had the strongest ground so far has been on health care. I think they clearly won the argument on health care. Uh, I think as, as President uh, Obama went out yesterday, I think they, they seem less divided. Uh, I think the extent to which I think everybody attacks our democracy or calls it illegitimate or divides the country, I don't think anybody wins in that discussion. I think the people who win in this discussion are those who unite the country. 91% in my Harvard-Harris poll want Democrats and Republicans to work together, even though they dislike them all in today's <laughs> politics. All right. Thank you for being here, Mark Penn. Appreciate it. Thank you. When we come back, a bipartisan bill on Obamacare facing opposition from some Republicans on Capitol Hill. So how good a deal is it for Republicans and Democrats? A bipartisan deal to temporarily prop up the Affordable Care Act appeared to be on thin ice late this week after President Trump signaled his disapproval. The Senate bill, sponsored by Republican Lamar Alexander and Democrat Patty Murray, would fund for two years the subsidies to health insurers that the administration cut off last week. After initially signaling his support for the plan, President Trump appeared to change course, tweeting, quote, I am supportive of Lamar as a person and also of the process, but I can never support bailing out insurance companies who have made a fortune with Obamacare. We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, and Kate Batchelder-Odell. So, Kate, uh, 
What do Democrats get out of this deal? Well, they get two years of cost-sharing subsidies, which Florida insurers that do defray the cost of, ca of deductibles and co-pays for low-income people. They also get about $100 million in Obamacare advertising funding, and it's funny to imagine To that, sign people up. Yes, it's funny to imagine they think that the marketing is really the problem. Um, but on the GOP side, what they get is a, a more ostensible state flexibility. Now, Obamacare proponents will always tell you that you know states can just send in a waiver and do whatever they want. Uh, but this is not actually true. The law sets all sorts of restrictions on uh, the benefits have to be as comprehensive as what Obamacare requires. It has to be at least as affordable. Uh, essentially, it says, governors, try whatever you want, as long as it's Obamacare or single Okay, care. but does this language change in this compromise actually deregulate those uh, restrictions? Well, the problem is not, it doesn't do enough. It basically is a small language change on affordability that would allow some waivers that have been held up in this long, uh, lengthy application process to move through. But it doesn't throw off the, the shackles of Obamacare and say, try, experiment with health savings oh. accounts or anything else. So why would Republicans like Lamar support it? Well, it's basically a prudential political choice. Uh, it, it amounts to, are, are Republicans going to take the blame for these subsidies getting cut off? Is there going to be chaos in the individual insurance market? But you, you've argued that there won't be insurance in chaos because the subsidies will go up to compensate, this is subsidies in individuals, to compensate for the lack of the subsidies to insurers. But prices will go up, right? Premiums, well, premiums will. will go up. And you're right, the tax credits will cover the delta for the cost-sharing subsidies, so the insurers get paid anyway. So I guess it's really more the perception of chaos. Are we going to have headlines for weeks and months about 20% premium increases and what do Republicans think about that? Also, this money was being spent illegally and I think Congress should try to appropriate and make it legal. Because a judge, federal judge, Congress sued President Obama for these subsidies right. and a federal judge said this violates the Constitution because there's no appropriation for them. So, Kim, what do you think of the politics here? I mean, are you with uh, Alexander or the skeptics? With the skeptics, look, the Republicans have this amazing opportunity right now to offer the Democrats one of the only thing that Democrats care about, which is more money to spend. And if they're going to do a deal, they should drive a pretty hard bargain. So either that can be done by Lamar Alexander in continuing negotiations in the Senate, and I think that that is what President Trump is trying to push happen with some of his skepticism, say, get a better deal here. Or probably even better, it would be a great thing to see House Republicans attempt to redeem themselves on health care by coming up with a, a stronger bargain in the House and then sending it over to the Senate and putting some pressure but from that direction. But, but uh, Dan, they don't want to vote on this in the House no. because it's not going to be repeal and replace. It's going to be essentially we're propping it up in return for some, some reform. Yeah, and I think the White House <clears throat> has begun to recognize that. I mean, I think probably what President Trump was saying was not being able to support this is he understands that the really big important vote coming up for him in the House is on that tax bill. Right. And since they opposed uh, Obamacare the first time around, he does not want a repeat of disaffected House Republicans saying they're forcing a bad Obamacare reform on us. Now we're we're going to have some problems with the tax bill. He's not going to take that risk. Kate, do you think that the Democrats uh, are going to go along with any kind of reform that Kim suggests uh, the Republicans should seek? Um, I'm not sure. I doubt it. But I think what we're getting at is the essential health care problem, which is what can pass the House, can't clear the Senate, and what clears the Senate can't get through the House. But what's the alternative? Give up? I mean, they have to try something. And I think there are a lot of reformers putting out good ideas on delaying the employer mandate, on uh, loosening the or delaying the or repealing or just getting rid of the individual mandate or allowing more health savings accounts or other arrangements. So I think that they have an obligation to keep trying to negotiate. And Kim, briefly, are you worried at all about, I mean, the politics here for the Republicans is that uh, they could get blamed for premium uh, increases. You, you think they should worry about that? They should worry about it, absolutely. This is not necessarily the pottery barn rule anymore. Uh, Democrats broke it, but Republicans now own it, um, and they are going to have to take some efforts to fix it. Okay, thank you all. We have to take one more break. When we come back, hits and misses of the week. Time now for our hits and misses of the week. Kim, first to you. 
So this is a miss to California, where Governor Jerry Brown recently signed a bill that allows residents, and this is a first ever in the country, allows residents to choose a third non-binary gender option on all of their state IDs. So birth certificates, uh, driver's licenses. You know, Paul, I'm a big fan that in our personal relations, we all need to respect each other, but that's a far cry from forcing state officials to have to choose to deal with people on their feelings rather than the facts of their birth. All right, Bill. Paul, big hit to Tom McCain, McCabe and the Freedom Foundation in Washington State. He and his Merry Warriors have been trying to inform home health care workers they don't need to join a union to do their jobs. When they did, 10,000 people opted out of the union and the SEI sued. SEIU, yeah. yeah SEIU. So now uh, a judge has thrown out that suit. The SEIU was complaining that they were interfering in their business model. The judge has thrown it out. Big victory for workers' rights. It tells you something about the argument today that it's the unions trying not to let workers know their rights. Mary. Uh, I'm giving a miss to Quebec for banning face veils. Uh, this is aimed at Muslim women who wear things uh, like hijabs um, and burqas. Uh, if you've gotten to the point where you're banning things, I think you've lost the argument. I think it just goes to show two things, Paul. Uh, controversial things do actually happen north of the border, but secondly, um, look, identity politics isn't just an American affliction. It happens in Canada, too. Dan. Okay, Paul. Paul, a big hit to a comedy group at Brigham Young University called Studio C. They have amassed one billion views on YouTube, mostly college students, despite the fact that their comedy is squeaky clean. Hard to believe you can actually still make people laugh without wallowing in the gutter. So I think this uh, Studio C, Brigham Young University, this could be the start of something good. All right, Dan, thank you. And remember, if you have your own hit or miss, be sure to tweet it to us at JR on FNC. That's it for this week's show. Thanks to my panel. Thanks to you for watching. I'm Paul Gigo. Hope to see you right here next week.